Uh, one of the uh, fun facts about our district is that when you have a district our size, obviously you can see being very diverse, we have to look at how we hire, who we hire, and what we want to represent in the leaders that we have coming through our district and leading the, the, the teams and also who's sharing the message out. Often we hear a lot of from the educational side, you want to hire for what the students in the classroom will see that they can eventually become. But that may not necessarily be true on our side of the, the world, which is the facilities and operations world, because we want to hire the best that do the job. <clears throat> a little bit about the, the department or the division that I oversee, business operations. It is the largest division in HISD with more than 6,000 students. It has all of the support departments except for finance in them, construction services, which builds our schools, facilities maintenance and operations, which I want to recognize Alicia Jolivet that's over that department, transportation services, which we uh, transport about 850 routes per day with about 1,200 buses on the road, nutrition services, which I had a discussion with a colleague from Detroit who we're proud to talk about with Betty Wiggins and how she leads that, business operations support, which has our 24-7 customer care center in it, and then our business operations strategic engagement and outreach department. Oh, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> you got to stay on point. <laughs> So the first thing that I want to, to, I guess you can say sizzle in your spirit, is about how you uh, identify talent. What do you look at as talent? Number one, you have to look at no matter how big or how small, talent is everywhere in your organization. Some of the most insightful information that I've ever gotten about when I was over facilities, when I was over custodial, when I was at any level of management came from the lowest levels of the department because they know the gossip, they know who's stealing the materials, they know who's working the hardest, and they also know which schools you may need to go to because we're having problems with those principals and here's why. So we need to understand talent is everywhere and it only needs the opportunity. You determine what and how that opportunity is. When we look at talent and we look at where we get it from, a lot of us have come into our roles either from outside of the district or outside of the organizations you're in, but we don't understand, quite honestly, how we can develop talent. We don't understand it because we're coming into a role possibly in a new position in a new organization. But we need to really, really look at the fact that a lot of your talent can be found within the department, within the district, within the organization. And the way you do that from searching for internal talent, having an honest conversation, I, I can never forget one of the first high level positions that I got. I was 23 years old and I was talking to them about what they expected with me from the job, what would my role, what would my expectations be on a day in and day out basis. And my manager stopped me and said, you didn't ask me about your salary. And I didn't understand it at the time because the way I was raised, you don't go in, you know, not seeming humble and not seeming that you were glad to be at the table. You don't want to talk money to turn people off. But I was taught in that experience, and the, the person that told me this, which is one of my consultants now that comes back and train, her name is Felicia German, she said, Brian, they won't respect you if you don't ask about your money. So what I try to do when I hire and bring in talent is I bring it up first. What are, your, what are your salary expectations? Because I need to know when I hire you, am I hiring you where you come in and you're still gonna be looking? Or am I hiring you to where you feel like even in your 20s, I can retire from here. Even in your 30s, this is where I wanna be. This is where I wanna raise my family. So I need to understand what I'm talking to and the best way to get into an intimate conversation with somebody about where they wanna be is to talk about their money on offering professional development opportunities. Some of us, and I came up from a school that I had a mix. I had some of the older people that were in my department, older by years of experience, that did not want to teach me anything because it's a fear that they're, I'm going to want to take their job. Then I had another group of employees that said, you know what, everything that I learned, I need to teach you some of it. The key of all that means you have to provi provide professional development at such a high level that when the employee sees you coming, they can expect that this is going to obviously be a teachable moment. 
in the discussions that you have with them. What are you walking away from those discussions as a takeaway? What do you see in your leader as a takeaway when they leave you? I've been in this now, this is my 21st year. This is my fourth year in this role. Every manager, supervisor that I've worked with, I've learned something from, no matter how good or bad. So what professional development, away from the modules, away from the CEUs, away from the conferences, what professional development are we putting in our talent pool to build up our bench strength of leaders so that when folks retire, leave, go on to bigger and better, we can pull someone up and say, you know what, I've been grooming you for years and you didn't even know it. The last thing is you have to treat leadership well. And leadership means the people that report to me, I have to treat them well. Fortunately, I have one employee that reports to me here, Alicia, and she can tell you, I treat them really, really well. Right, Alicia? <laughs> so her silence is, is, is golden. But the, the key of it all is it means when I noticeably see that my employees, the direct reports to me, need something, they're not feeling well. I'm not their mother or father. Now, I'm not here to be an extension of your house, but I'm here to make sure that you are well so that you can support me. Because if you're not well, you're no good to you or me. So I force my employees go home. I force my employees take off time to be with your families. I force my employees in our staff meetings. When you go off on vacation, and this is gonna be crazy to say to this room, cut your phone off. I, I know, I know, John. But the point I'm making is, if you are saying to me that when you take off work, the people that report to you can't handle it, then you're not doing your job anyway. So the question you have to ask yourself is, are you developing leadership through actions? Are you developing leadership through words and pamphlets and handouts that you're giving at staff meetings, but you're not living by it? It's almost like somebody carrying a Bible around every day and cuss all day long and call people this, that, and the third. That's just a book. But from your acting and from what you do, how are you treating the leadership that supports you in order to, for you to develop that talent? Identifying the standouts. When we look at the standout employees, it's not just an employee that stays late. It's not just an employee that finishes the work and follows up with folks to ensure that the work is completed to a satisfac satisfactory uh, level. It's employees or team members that go above and beyond in every single thing they do. It's just like a coach I had when I played sports. They used to tell us at the end of a practice, it's not the stuff that you do when people are looking, it's what you're doing when no one's around but you. And that's where your standout employees are going to show that they're either one, invested in your mission, two, engaged beyond, your, beyond the work duties, by engagement means they're encouraging other folks, they're encouraging other team members, they're basically holding themselves accountable for any failures that go on. The number one thing that I learned in leadership, and I learned it a lot, coincidentally I traveled uh, about five to 10 years ago on these peer reviews with John Dufay and some of the other leaders and facilities that have gone around and done peer reviews, but one of the things that I heard, and John didn't think I was listening, uh, but we would do interviews of the facility staff or the staffs of the different districts that we visited in different states. One of the things I heard John and them say is when the people leave out, because you know that's when you start talking about them after they leave, is John would say, I didn't hear anybody of that group say, I own this, this problem that we identified. So the accountability did not start with the leadership. So why would we expect the accountability to fall down into the lower levels of the organization? The other side of that has to do with how you approach who you are developing. So when you look at from a development standpoint and you look at developing leaders, are you identifying someone because you don't have a woman? Are you identifying someone because you don't have a Hispanic person, African American person? Are you identifying the talent within your organization regardless of who's giving you the talent? If you're trying to keep up with a quota, you will never develop a leader. If you're trying to satisfy the political will of the establishment that you work for, you will never develop a leader. But if you are trying to take your organization from a facility standpoint, operation standpoint, organizational standpoint to the next level, you have to identify that talent, hone in on it, like a plant, water it, nurture it, and then follow up and check on it. 
that young lady that's in the customer care center who didn't know that I was looking at her leadership skills, who didn't know that I was looking at what she was gonna do beyond this conversation when I came back to check on her was unofficially being interviewed. How many of you done that? How many of you talked to employees on your teams and walked away from that conversation, you, saying, you know what, when I get another supervisor position or manager position, I got to have that person. I got to have that guy. The other thing is effective communication. Effective communication does not mean going down into the organization creating silos. It means having an ebb and flow of communication that by both ends can be susceptible to the person sending and the person receiving. And then the other side of that, as your leadership, what does your communication say? Well, people come in and they start off, and I've had managers say, I got an open door policy. What does that mean? Because you really don't. You really do not want to leave your door open and any and everybody can just walk in. What you're really saying is, I have an open mind policy. But before you come to that door, make an appointment, right? But you're not saying that. So how effective is your communication when you intro yourself, when you follow up with that communication, and when the person calls you out on what you said in your introductory speech when you joined the organization 10 months ago or like uh, the guy from uh, Chicago a year ago? How effective is that when your employees follow up with you? The other thing you have to look at is how you change the conversation and how you change the communication. You encouraging your employees with their ambitions and career paths. One of the things that I tried to make sure that I didn't do is force the things that I was doing on the employees that reported to me. If I was going to grad school to work on my master's, it does not mean you automatically have to do that. But if I see something in you that will be enhanced by the experience of doing that, I'm gonna encourage you. If I see something in you as an electrical apprentice to say, listen, you need to keep on until you get your journeyman's license, I'm gonna encourage you. Because a lot of times, people are not necessarily looking for new information. They're looking for affirmation of the things that they've already put in their mind that they wanna do, but nobody has ever taken them and said, come on and let's try and go do this. Come on, I see more in you than you see in yourself. We don't know where people have gone, but we can be a part positively of where they're headed to, okay? When you look at buy-in by providing employees ac access from a leadership standpoint to motivational speakers, to workshops and things that they've done, previous administrations before my time, they never let us go out to conferences and different things. The first thing they would ask is, how much does it cost? Well, why do you have to stay at this hotel? Are you sure it's this much a night, but we can only do this much, and then you do the rest? That diminishes for the employee or the person that's going to go, hell, why do I even need to go if you're going to do me like that? So when you look at this, if it's good enough for us to be here at this conference, it's good enough for your employees to be at the ones that are applicable to their skill set. When you develop that skill set, they go to those conferences, they get the notoriety of having presented, they've passed on what best practices are within the organization, they bring that back. Who ends up getting the credit and the notoriety for their success anyway? You. So as leaders, who are you doing it for and what are you doing it for is gonna go into the buy-in the employee has and wanted to follow or not follow you. Also, some of the most powerful advice, as you see in the last bullet, comes from employees who have successfully ascended to higher roles. Those employees are employees that have gone on, but then they have the who spot to look back and they talk to the organization without you knowing. They still have hands in it. They still have relationships in it. They still go to lunch with folks from the organization. How are you tying in people's successes that came from out of the organization to what you want to see for upcoming employees? How are you tying in your successes if you were internally homegrown to how you see yourself in another employee within the organization? Spotlighting internal talent. So again, I don't believe that you can talk about what you expect to do from an internal talent standpoint if you're not doing it yourself. And so when I started to put together the mindset and the framework for this presentation and how I would roll it out to you, I had to think about people that were on my team that I found within the organization. Number one, Eugene Salazar. Eugene Salazar is my deputy COO. 
But Eugene, when we first met, almost was over me because Eugene was over finance for my former general manager about 10 years ago when we were in facilities. And then when I became promoted to be over facilities, Eugene worked for me. It wasn't until Eugene started working for me until I told him who Eugene is a very loyal person, very knowledgeable person and well-rounded. I said, Eugene, you should be doing more than this. I don't want to lose you and you can't have this job in HISD, but there are other districts <laughs> And it's an honest conversation. You have to prepare people for doing your job. And the way you prepare them is you put them in situations that say, this is something we really need you for, but I'm sending you because I want to get you ready. John can attest to this. After Hurricane Harvey, which was the most devastating hurricane Texas and some other uh, countries and, and states around us had ever seen in American history, I got a call, as John did, to go out to Puerto Rico and help Puerto Rico put uh, their district back together. I could have easily left and went and did because we had HISD back up and running. I sent Eugene. So Eugene worked alongside John Dufay, Michael Cassidy with the Council of Greater City Schools and all of that. And he came back feeling empowered, right? He never, now let me be clear, he doesn't park in my parking spot. But he came back feeling like, you know what? I'm a lot more important to the organization from a global perspective than I was before because I put him in an opportunity where it could have been all about me. I sent Eugene somewhere with people, and John can tell you this with CGCS, that helped make recommendations about who should be the next COOs and superintendents in our larger school districts. He's now part of that, that, that group, John Wilcox. I had a big, big snafu with transportation where we weren't getting kids to bus uh, school on time. We were having a lot of issues with our new um, routing and scheduling system, our GPS system. It was nationwide. And the poster child of it was me because I owned it and I would not throw the person I had in John's position under the bus. I just, I'm just not going to do that. But here's the, and I'm not knocking the guy that was there before John, but here's the rub. When I identified that I needed to make a change after months of continuousness, and you, as you all know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same result. And when I identified that there was a change that was needed, I went to John and had a regular conversation. John was a bus driver. John was a terminal manager. He had been a training manager. He had no idea that the conversation we were having, an hour later, I was going to make the change. What I'm saying to you is, when you look at the talent that we have within, now, a year later, after hiring John, who has no degree, right? I have an executive MBA. So my thinking is, everybody around me needs to be at my level or higher. John has no degree. John has been in transportation for 20 years. He's driven a bus. He's been a manager. And he's done all those things, as you see under his name. John has fixed transportation within six to eight months. We have no issues. We have an average of about 1,100 buses with about 10 late per day. John has fixed communication with all pockets of HISD. And the number one success that I can say that I did to help John was get out of his way. But again, internal talent. When you look at internal talent here, we have Alicia Jolivet who's here over facilities. Alicia and I used to pass each other in the hallway, going to the cafeteria. Both had solemn looks on our face because we felt like we didn't make no money, but we was working so much harder. We knew more than our bosses. Are you still in it? Yeah, I'm still in it. Well, what you still doing here? Ain't no, don't nobody want me. I'm just going to stick it out and so on and so forth. Nobody could have told Alicia or told me that 20 years later, Alicia would have moved over into my department facilities and just been a part of my team to fix our uh, plant maintenance solution as well as our CMMS process, nobody could have told her that after I ascended up to this role that I would have tapped her for being over facilities because there were other obvious picks. But the talent that was, was developed within Alicia was developed long before me. I just tapped into it and pushed her higher and got out of her way. Now. She runs facilities 
much, much better than I ever did. But the difference is, I don't know if she'll be as good as me. <laughs> but as we move on, uh, planning for the future. How do you plan for the future and have senior leadership be on the same page with you? One of the most difficult things to tell your senior leadership team is to bring their organizational charts to your staff meeting. And when they bring them to the staff meeting, tell them to identify who on that organizational chart is going to take their place. When you tell them to do that, they'll first think, oh, shit, you're trying to fire me. OK? But that's not what you're doing. You're telling them that anything can happen. You can be promoted. You can say, forget this and quit. Anything can happen. So I want you to identify on the organizational chart, and I'll start with me, right? So I told them, Eugene is taking my place if I ever leave. And I don't have control of that, but I'm saying he's ready to take my place if I ever leave. Who on your team is uh, uh, ready to do that? So I asked them, and of course, they're not going to give me the answer that day or the day after. But I told them to have it etched in the back of your mind. This is the type of professional development that starts without a, a conference. It starts without a, a, a seminar, a guest speaker. It starts from within, identifying the talent within your organization. The other thing is, what are you doing to prepare that person? What are you doing to let that person know you're the person that I've identified and selected to be the uh, uh, next step, just in case there's a position available that fits your talent pool? What are you also doing to understand that person's career goals? Because they may not want to take on the headache that they see you deal with day in and day out. They may not want to step up because of family obligations, because of health obligations, because of different things and say, you know what? I'm ready to start doing that. The other thing is, what part of the job do you find yourself doing with compassion and caring? Because we all have these licenses, certifications, some with degrees, all kinds of you know alphabets behind your last name with commas, but what does it all mean when you align it to the compassion about how you do your job and how you treat the leaders on your team? Then the other and final piece to this is trust. How do you build trust in your organization by doing these things and expecting to see an ROI in the way that you treat your employees and your leaders and in the way that you're developing them for the next level? Because trust is not a teachable thing. It's not a, a, a synonym or now. It's an action word. And trust works both ways. I said it. I did it. I said I was going to do it. I ended up doing it. I said that I'm going to work on it. You see me from afar, the employee, working on it. But trust is not saying, here's what I'm thinking that I want to do. Here's the salary I think I want to get you, when you know in the back of your mind there's no possible way you can get it, so you're just th shooting the dice. Trust is actually building it and showing the employees that you're trying to develop and retain you matter to me. And I can say this because a lot of you probably know that in HISD right now, we have, we're dealing with a state takeover. I can say from not only the things that I've talked to you about, but from a trust perspective, nobody from my business operations leadership team has left. And I haven't received any calls for reference checks, so I don't think they're looking for other jobs unless they just didn't list me. Planning for succession. When you look at planning for succession, these are the things you want to do from a checklist perspective. You want to conduct an organizational inventory. That's not necessarily physical. That's common sense. Sitting down, looking at the names. Stop, stop, look, stop looking at who gets the perfect attendance awards every year and who's actually getting the hard work awards every year that you don't give out. The other things, you have to recognize standouts and put them to work. How are the standouts mattering to you? How are you allowing them to share their knowledge and be a part of the process? Travel. We talked about conferences and the fact that we're here. How many of you are going to go back to your teams and tell them, find me a professional development, I don't care where it is, and bring it to me and explain to me why you need to go? OK? Encourage growth and promotion. Developing a career ladder in our employee handbook. 
I asked the professional development group, I want to see the lowest position in every single org. And on one side, show the employee what they're going to have to do on their own to get to the next level. On the left side, show what the district will be doing to invest in them to build them up. As we do those things, you're showing the employee from a, a, a familiar song uh, Johnny Taylor wrote years before my time, I believe in you and you believe in me too. So at the end of the day, the, their trust is being built through the actions. Be forthright about the qualities and skills needed for the promotion and provide related opportunities. Everybody's not ready to be a manager. But how many of you are having an honest conversation to say, you know, Joe, I know you asked me about the supervisor position that keeps coming up and you keep not getting, but let me be honest with you. Joe, the fact that you don't come to work on Mondays or every other Monday you're out is why I'll probably never consider you for that position. And it sounds harsh, but here's the difference. Joe may want to whoop me. Joe may dislike me, but Joe can never tell you that I lied to him. Joe can never tell you that I said apply and we may look at you. Apply, they may interview you. Apply, put my name down as a reference. Joe can't tell you that. So those are the things that you want to focus on as you plan for succession, as you try to develop your employees, and as you try to build trust in the employees that you have. I appreciate your time, and I'll take questions at this point about anything that we've talked about or any general questions you have. Any questions? We have time, for, unfortunately, only time for one question, but. Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Carrie Bateman. I'm, I'm from the New York City Department of Education, Chief Operating Officer for our division. And Mr. Garanza. Uh, yes, uh, with yeah. Deputy Chancellor Goldmark. Yeah. And um, one of the things I really appreciate about your presentation is talking about the talent from within and how it's critical, as you were saying, to meet with different team members across um, the division so that you can understand what's going on in the ground. Mm -hmm. And a question I have for you is how do you um, navigate the decision around hiring from within and internal teams, but also thinking about being change agents and perhaps bringing perspective from a different background when you're looking to make an organizational change? How do you uh, compare those or what process do you use to think about that? So in a quick way to answer that, I think there are three things you have to look at when you're hiring leadership, whether it's within or external. Number one, you have to look at, besides the skill set, what type of leader, as you know the, the different habits, obviously Stephen Covey, what type of leader do you need for that team? What have you seen in that team? Or do they need an inspirational? Do they need an authoritarian? Do they need a, a forceful leader? Number two, does that team need a, 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 a exotic change? Do they need someone that comes from the outside with fresh ideas, someone that's going to bring a fresh perspective, and also someone that is not going to try to be the people's champ, right? Every de bad decision that they have to bring back to the team, well, Karen told me, right? And I'm just letting y'all know it's not me. Every good decision, guys, guess what I did? I told Karen, we got to do this. So what type of leader do you need? Once you identify those qualities, then you take the resumes, you take the names off the resumes, and then you start looking at, at requirements and skill sets. Do they meet the educational requirements that the job already says? Do they meet the relevant experience requirements? And then once you factor in all of those, then that should filter out your first round of interviews. And I think from an interview perspective, face to face, I think it'll help you decipher between whether the person is the fit or not a fit. Because oftentimes we look at resumes and some of these resumes don't tell you that they're on some type of medication so that they from eight to five can be calm. Some of these resumes don't tell you they cussed out their last manager before they left and different things. So those are the things that a face-to-face -face discussion and real discussion uh, does. Brian, this was an excellent presentation. Um, fortunately, we are out of time, but thank you so much. And uh, round of applause, everybody, for Brian. Thanks.